I felt like I wanted to bring to you a word um, from John's Gospel, and I particularly wanted to focus on Jesus' metaphor or Jesus' word picture to describe himself uh, as the Good Shepherd. It's probably the most um, or mo much loved kind of biblical metaphor for Jesus, isn't it? I mean, it's celebrated in um, stained glass windows and art and paintings, and we all love the idea that Jesus is the Good Shepherd. And it kind of conjures ideas for us that, like, he's attentive and loving and caring, and, you know, he, he has his eye on us in particular. There's a sort of a sense of intimacy and pastoral protection and love and nurture. Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's not at all what Jesus was talking about when he said, I am the Good Shepherd. You see, he talked about shepherds a few times and all the stuff I just said before about the shepherd being attentive and loving and caring, and that all comes from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, where Jesus tells a parable about the shepherd who leaves 99 sheep and goes and finds the one lost one. And he is referring to himself as the one who rescues the lost. So it is a reference to him. But when he talks about himself being the good shepherd, it's John chapter 9. And he's actually not being really nice and gentle and sweet and loving when he says it. We need to understand the context before I read the passage to you. And I hope in doing so, I'll remind you of something really beautiful and powerful about our King and our friend and our Saviour, our Rock, our Redeemer, Jesus. He's the, the shepherd who leaves the 99, but he's also a really fierce shepherd, as you'll find in John chapter 10. Here's how it begins in John chapter 9. Um, there is John chapter 9, just come up there. Um, <laughs> how did you people know that? Um, in John chapter 9, we have a really long and convoluted miracle that Jesus uh, uh, performs. It's where Jesus heals a man who was born blind. Are you familiar with this story? It's not a simple miracle. How many times does Jesus just touch someone? Dzz, and they're healed. Like he says a word and someone in another place is healed, remember? Like it can be very simple, very discreet, very kind of, you know, under the counter. Jesus can heal in all sorts of ways. But this particular story, Jesus is really being as flashy as he can. It's a kind of staged miracle. Jesus meets a man who was born blind, not got glaucoma, not been in an accident, not his his eyesight has slowly faded, never, ever seen anything, ever. Jesus sees this man calling out to him and decides, ah, I think we could do something here. And instead of just boop, healed, instead of just saying the word, you know what he does. He spits in the dirt, turns it into muddy paste, rubs it in the eyes of the blind man and says, now you've got to go all the way into town to the pool of Shalom and wash it off. Why does Jesus do this? Because he's trying to draw attention to this miracle. Because everyone who was around would be like, whoa, hold on, wait a second. He was born blind, Jesus. Like, he ain't going to see. And then there's the mud spitting kind of thing. This is weird. So a crowd would have gathered. And then he's going to make his way all the way to the pool of Shalom. Don't you imagine the crowd would have built as he made his way? Don't you think when people are like, what's with this? What's happening? What's going on? This guy's going to wash this mud off his eyes. Apparently, he's going to be able to see. Like, it was going to be a big deal. It's a big, flashy, show-offy miracle. And the guy washes the mud off his eyes, and there's something kind of charming and kind of unsophisticated about it, isn't it? He washes the, the mud from his eyes, and he kind of blinks light into his eyes, and there's this kind of lovely notion where it's like, people kind of look like trees, meaning... I don't know what the heck I'm seeing because I've never seen anything before in my whole life. It is a really primitive, really magnificent expression of God's love to an incredibly fragile person. In Jesus' time, thank God it's not like this anymore, but a person who was born blind would never have been equipped through a school system or educational with support mechanisms to live a productive adult life. If he made it to adulthood as a blind man, he couldn't read, he couldn't write, he had no trade, he wouldn't be married, he had no kids. He's an adult man living with his parents. That's tantamount to being a little boy. He is socially dislocated. He is, in many respects in terms of the community, cut off and marginalised. 
And Jesus heals this man with this flashy display. The whole community is talking. And what happens next is utterly despicable. It's cringeworthy. The Pharisees seeing this miracle and knowing that everyone has seen it, it's undeniable. It's not like, well, we can explain it away by this or that or the other thing. It is undeniable. This man who could not once ever see now can see. And so they decide the only way we can discredit this is not to deny it or not to say it didn't happen because clearly it did, but they decide that what they'll do is they'll make out that the power that Jesus uses to heal that man didn't come from Yahweh, it came from some demonic or, or dark place. And so what do they do to prove that this is the case? They bring this man, socially dislocated, really limited, almost childlike, they bring him before a religious tribunal where he has to stand in front of the most learned, most educated, most religiously powerful people in Israel. And they grill him and they say to him, where do you think Jesus got the power from to do this to you? And if you read it, some people kind of think he's being a smart aleck. I read it like he's like a child. He says, I don't know. All I know is once I was blind and now I can see. And they keep grilling him. And at one point he says, why are you asking about him so much? Do you, do you want to follow him too? <laughs> I don't think he's trying to be funny. And I don't think he's trying to be a smart aleck. It's like a little tiny boy. And they're putting him on trial for having the temerity to have been healed. It's like the way we put rape victims on trial at the trials of, the, of their, their, their assaulters. Like, it's despicable. It's, it's, it's utterly unconscionable. That kind of stuff infuriates me. When the powerful, and particularly the religiously powerful, bully and humiliate and terrorise the most vulnerable and marginal people. And in the end, they say to him, ah, you're an idiot, you're a child. You don't know what you're talking about. Get his parents in here. Now, do you know what that was designed to do? If a man had to have his parents speak for him, that meant he was a child. They're like publicly humiliating. Get, get his parents to speak for him. And they say to his parents, who are clearly terrified, you tell us, where do you think the power came from to heal your son? And John's Gospel says to us, they knew this power must have come from God. But they answered, oh, we don't know for fear of recrimination. This is religious bullying. This is toxic religion. This is fear-mongering of the most dreadful kind in the name of Yahweh. And so at the end of John chapter 9, Jesus appears back in the narrative. And guess what? He ain't happy. He's not the gentle shepherd who's gone out to look for the one lost sheep. He's like a furious shepherd. At the end of, of John chapter 9, he appears again and he makes one of those classic aphorisms that are all the way through John's gospel. He said, I have come so that the blind may see and those who can see may be made blind. You know how that's all the way through John's gospel? It's like... <laughs> Like the first will be last, the last will be first. Like he does it all the time. So he appears and he says, I've come that the blind may see and those who are see uh, are made blind. And then the Pharisees realising, wait a second, is he talking about us? <laughs> and the last verse of chapter 9 is a zinger. Jesus says to them, whipping in their direction, he says, if you were blind... You would have an excuse for your behavior. If you were blind, this guilt would not be held against you. But because you say that you can see, your guilt remains. Whew. You don't want Jesus talking like that to you, right? I mean, he is not happy. And then here's the bummer. Is it in your Bible, the chapter ends, and then there's a new chapter 10, and you think, end of that scene, into the next one. No, it continues. 
In John chapter 10, everything that he says there about being a good shepherd is in this same conversation. Your guilt remains, he says. And then he launches into this diatribe where he compares them and Israel and himself to sheep and shepherds, wolves and, uh, and thieves. Let me just read it directly to you. This is John 10 verse 1, following directly on from that condemnation. He says, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep will listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They'll never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they don't recognise the stranger's voice. Now, Jesus, we're told, was using this as a figure of speech, which we understand. But then in verse 6, it says, the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. They had no clue. Was he talking about us or him or why? What's this all about? So Jesus repeats it. He says, all right, I'll tell you again. I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find uh, pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now listen to what he's saying here. The metaphors shift around a bit at various points. He's the shepherd and then he's the gate. At times they're like wolves and then sometimes they're like thieves. But in effect, what he's saying is this. We, as, as Jews, Israel, entered into a covenant with Yahweh to be an entirely new kind of human being on this planet. We were called by God not to be like all the other pagan nations of darkness and human sacrifice and misogyny and hatred and violence and cruelty. We were called into this relationship with Yahweh to be a whole new kind of human being, a community of justice and reconciliation and peace and love and hospitality and mercy. But you know what you Pharisees have done? You've taken this magnificent vision to live life to the full, to be everything God intended us to be from the very beginning, and you have turned it into a set of rules and laws. You have penned them in. You have trapped the sheep in the sheep pen. We always think of the sheep being kind of safe and warm and happy in a sheep pen. Sheep don't want to be in sheep pens. Sheep hate being in a sheep pen. They're, they're herded in there at night just to be kept safe from the wolves. But as soon as there's the, the, the beginnings of the day bursting over the horizon, sheep start agitating and bleating. They want out. So when Jesus uses this as a metaphor, he's saying, Israel's like the sheep and you've penned them in and they're terrified of you. You're like wolves. You're like thieves. These poor women, this poor woman can't even answer your question about where my power came from because they're terrified of you. Of course they don't follow you. They hear your voice and it means nothing to them. You terrorise them with toxic religion. But guess what? I am the good shepherd. The inference being, you are evil shepherds. Now they are outraged at this, absolutely outraged. They think this is just astonishing. How, they say this man must be deluded. But not only do they think that he's deluded, Jesus isn't going to stop yet. He keeps going. So in verse 11 he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. He says it again. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Now listen to this. Verse 16, he says, I am have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And at that point, the Pharisees say, he's not deluded. He is filled with evil spirits. Is he daring to tell us that he has come to blow the gate open on this sheep pen, to destroy all our legalism, all our control? And is he daring to tell us that there are people from other pagan 
nations, sheep pens, that he will draw together in some kind of multi-ethnic, multi-religious kind of vision of what it means to follow God? And the fact of the matter is, the answer to that is yes. This is the extraordinary vision of the good shepherd. He has come to destroy toxic religion. He has come to destroy fear and manipulation and control. He's come to destroy threats of excommunication. He's come to destroy those who say, you can come in, but you can't come in. You're welcome, but you're not. When he says, I am the good shepherd, he is saying, I've come to blow this thing up. Not, not to cancel the law. I've come to fulfill that. The law is given so that we would become this kind of flourishing form of humanity that God intended. I'm blowing up the sheep pen, all your ridiculous nitpicking laws. I'm blowing up a world where you can humiliate this poor man that I've just healed. I'm blowing that up. And I'm calling people from all over the place to join in this magnificent experiment of what it could look like to have defeated sin and death and the devil and to enter into a new covenant under me the shepherd, the king and the saviour. And then when you get to the end of John chapter 10 and you realise that's what he's doing. He didn't just come just so that he could die for my sins so I could go to heaven one day. He came to blow up religion. He came out to set me free. No sheep wants to be in the pen. They want to be out on the, on the, the green hillsides. And Jesus is saying that's what you were destined for. And when you finally get that in John chapter 10, you think, oh, of course. Like, why didn't I get this? Like, this is how John's gospel begins, is it not? In John chapter 2, what's Jesus' first miracle? Turning water into wine. It's not just a party trick. You know what's going on in, in, in the wedding at Cana? Like, everyone, everyone pretty much knows that you know, when, uh, when, a father's, when a man's wife gave birth to a girl... Yeah, he's a little disappointed, he had no one to take over the family business or work on the farm. But he had a girl, a woman, who would care for him in his old age. And the tradition was that you would go to your table stock, your wine, that you drink with your meals, because water is usually kind of uh, full of bacteria. You just go to your vinegary wa your wine that you quaff with your meals, and you draw off a barrel of that vinegary wine, and you put it aside on the day of her birth. And then you do that every year on her birthday draw off another barrel of vinegary red wine and put it aside until the day of her wedding. She might be 15, 16 years old, which means you've got 15 or 16 barrels of wine. Some of it tastes like vinegar, but some of it tastes like South Australian Cabernet. <laughs> some of it is 16 years old. And the tradition, of course, always was, you don't start with the vinegar, you go straight to the 16-year-old stuff, right? You crack that barrel first. We all dunk our, our, our cups into it, and then the master of ceremonies would say, to the father of the bride, what kind of man are you that you would have so faithfully prepared for this day out of love for your daughter? Here's to the father. <laughs> and our taste buds would tell us how much he loved his daughter. And then we would drink our way through 16 barrels of wine. <laughs> Until by the 16th, it tastes like vinegar. But do we care? <laughs> In this instance, however, this particular wedding runs out of wine. Sometimes it's hard for us to imagine what kind of shame would be associated with this. Whereas someone might see me walking down the street and saying, I remember that wine you had for your daughter. What a father are you? But for this man, it could be, oh, yeah, you were the guy that didn't prepare for your daughter. That's shame for the rest of your life. So Mary, the mother of Christ, says to Jesus, Jesus, they've run out of wine. I've often wondered how many times Mary might have pulled this line, you know, like... <laughs> You know, it's like I'm baking scones for the, the, the synagogue, you know, stall. Um, I'm out of flour. Jesus. 
How many times Jesus said, Mom, I told you, no. But on this occasion when Mary says, they're out of wine, Jesus sees something and realizes, actually, yeah, this would be the perfect time. What does he see? He sees great urns filled with water, which were used for what? For ceremonial washing. This is magic water. This is the water that us Jews use to wash ourselves when we become contaminated by Gentiles. If I do a business transaction with a Gentile, I've been contaminated, have to go through a, a ritual cleansing. If I've touched one, if I've had anything to do with one, this water is literally a physical symbol of the line between the in and the out, the welcome and the unwelcome, the clean and the unclean, the holy and the unholy, the good and the bad, the Jew and the Gentile. Jesus sees that in the corner, a symbol of religious separation. And Jesus thinks, actually, Mum, I think this could be the perfect way for me to start my public ministry. He turns a symbol of religious separation and exclusion into wine, which in every culture in the world is a symbol of hospitality and inclusion. So, of course, that's John chapter 2, and he just keeps doing that again and again and again. By the time we get to John chapter 10, I'm the good shepherd. I'm bursting open the gates. I'm leading you to freedom. Come with me if you want to live. Like, now, this is not religion. This is a new covenant a whole new way of people being human. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to include that uh, centurion who wanted me to save his servant, uh, heal his servant. I'm going to include that Samaritan woman who'd been married five times. I'm going to include outsiders. I'm going to include uh, the, the excluded. I'm going to include those who are uh, uh, disabled, those who have been excluded in all sorts of ways. They will be caught up in this. And wait, it gets even better. I'm including... Everyone from every tribe, nation or tongue who would come and hear my voice and follow me. When Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, he is saying, don't you ever, ever think that you could take what I've invited you into and turn it into a controlling, manipulative form of toxic religion. When you start creating these rules and regulations these forms of exclusion and control, you know that you are drifting into exactly the same zone that those Pharisees found themselves in. And this continues all the way through the gospel until at the point at which he gives up his life, as he'd said he would do in John chapter 10, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep at the point at which he offers up his soul and dies on the cross, what happens? But the greatest, most impenetrable symbol of religious separation, the great curtain in the Holy of Holies, is rent from top to bottom. Now, anyone who's actually really read the gospel closely would think when they see that, of course. Of course, it starts with water into wine. It turns into images of shepherds leading us to freedom. And of course, it would end up with him shattering the greatest and most impenetrable symbol of separation of all. My friends, when we say that we follow the good shepherd... It's not just that he died for our sins. It's that he's teaching us a whole new way of being human. The way of inclusion and love, of reconciliation and peacemaking. To be a people unlike anyone has ever seen. This is the gospel. I was, I was in a cafe the other day and this American tourist, I live in Manly, it's a bit touristy, so this tourist was sitting at the table next to me and he asked me some, something, you know, about the neighbourhood, like a tourist would, so I was giving him some tips. 
And he said, oh, look, while I've got you, he said, would you mind if I just ask you a more personal question? He said, well, I am an Australian, so the answer to that will be no. <laughs> but I'm a polite one, so I said, sure, go right ahead. And he said, um, if you were to die tonight, <laughs> do you know where you would spend eternity? I'd love him, you know, I mean, he doesn't know me, but he was trying to be kind to me, right? And I was like, actually, damn straight I do. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm, I've, I've put my trust in Jesus. Oh, he said, you're a believer. That's awesome. Oh, that's so good. And I said, actually, while I've got you, could I ask you a personal question as well? <laughs> yeah, sure, go ahead. I said, are you able to tell me that the risen Christ the, the boundary shatterer, the, the, the gate opener. The risen Christ spirit lives in you and is using you for the rescue, the renewal, the restoration of all things to remind us and show us all of what it looks like to live life and to live it to the full here and now before you die. And he said, well... Yeah, but that's not the gospel. And I said, brother, what you ask me is the gospel and what I asked you is the gospel. And you separate those things out, you haven't got the gospel. Here's our problem, folks. We reduce this gospel just down to information for how we get to go to heaven when we die. It's not just that. It is actually a whole new way of living into everything that Israel couldn't live into. Jesus does. He satisfies the covenant. He dies for our sins. He blows the whole thing off its hinges and invites all of us to enter into this magnificent new way of following him. I was telling uh, young adults today, well, yesterday, I can't remember, um, about how uh, during the, uh, the worst days of our um, government's uh, immigration detention policies where we were putting families on Nauru and literally wrenching every sense of hope away from them. Just the most unconscionable and vile and evil policy you could possibly imagine. I'm, uh, so I can't even begin to speak about how I felt about that. Done in my name and using my taxes. I've been involved in all sorts of protests and visited my local member a lot. My local member didn't really like me that much. His name was Tony Abbott, so you can imagine <laughs> how open he was to what I had to say to him. But, but on one occasion, a group of us, all ministers, priests and, uh, and ministers from different denominations, we decided that we would chain ourselves to the gates of Kirribilli House. Uh, in Sydney, the Prime Minister's residence. The Prime Minister at the time was Malcolm Turnbull. And the Prime Minister, when he's in Sydney, wasn't living at Kirribilli House because he has a ten times better house on the other side of the harbour. Is that not a metaphor for our lack of hospitality? And so he went to the empty Kirribilli House. We've got so much room in this country, we can actually have houses like that that just sit vacant. And we chained ourselves by our necks to the, to the gates of Kirribilli House. The police showed up. They put police tape around like it was a crime scene or something. The media buses pulled up. They put lights on us. Police are telling us, you know, you've got to go. We're like, we can't go. We threw away the key. Where are you? No, we don't know where the keys are. Like, we're, all, we're stuck here. And so um, people are interviewing us for the TV news. Some friends showed up. My wife showed up. Like, not again. <laughs> now, Kirribilli is in, like, on the north shore of Sydney Harbour. It's like one of the wealthiest and most conservative electorates in the country. Um, it's not Tony Abbott's electorate, it's Troy Zimmerman's electorate, but still a super blue ribbon liberal electorate. So I actually thought, I suspect that the neighbours here are going to be really annoyed about this. But I was astonished by what happened. People would kind of slip under the police tape and come over and say, I just want to shake your hand for doing what you're doing. People would walk up and down like shaking all of our hands. Some guy said, I had a fish and chip shop around the corner. Do you guys want fish and chips? 
I was like, I'm chained by the neck. I don't want fish and chips. Like, someone said, um, you're going to stand up the whole time? Like, I can get you some milk crates from my, my general store. He comes back with, like, these plastic milk crates so we could slide down the... <laughs> sit on the milk crates. And then some lady goes, those milk crates don't look very comfortable. She goes home and comes back with, like, cushions off her couch <laughs> for us to sit on. We had this uh, trans woman come over, slipped under the... Um, under the, uh, the, the police tape, and she said to us, I've been watching this on uh, Facebook Live, she said. She said, um, I don't tell you my whole life story, she said, but I've got a family gathering tomorrow, which I'm really dreading, and I made a fruitcake to kind of like as, like a nice thing for my family. She said, but I was just watching you guys, and I thought, nah, those guys should eat my fruitcake. So she comes with like a little cake tin and she's like pulling out, would you like some fruitcake? I didn't want fruitcake any more than I wanted fish and chips. But I couldn't say no. It almost felt like communion. She's passing me this hank of fruitcake. And then this woman, probably in her early 60s, she came to us and she said, I'm Jewish. She said, I'm totally secular. I'm not religious at all. She said, but... I know that most of my extended family died during the Holocaust and a lot of them had tried to get out of Germany. They tried to get to the UK or to the US and they were turned back. And now, here I am, one of the sole survivors in Australia and my government is doing the same thing. She said, I want to stand with you. And we said, well, please stand with us, like, emotionally, but... We're all ministers of the gospel. We're doing this in Jesus' name because Jesus taught us another way to be human, a way of generosity and hospitality. So we don't want to be exclusive here or anything, but we're doing it in the name of Jesus. And she said, well, how little do I have to believe to be able to do this in the name of Jesus too? (laughs) And the guy who was next to me on the end He's like, oh, there's not a lot you have to believe, but like Jesus is king, he died for your sins, he satisfied the covenant. Uh, In so doing, he opens it up for us all to enter in, to see him as king, to enter under his reign, to bend the knee before God as your saviour, king and lord, and to commit yourself to, to, to a life of service, to be renewed and transformed by the Holy Spirit in your life. And she said, okay. And I was like, Jared, like, shouldn't she go through some catechism or something? Like, I mean, (laughs) he's like, that's enough for me. Join us, sister. So this woman wasn't chained. She stood next to us. The cops were barking orders at us and yelling at us and people were interviewed. She's standing with us the whole time. And uh, then they're, like, they get these big bolt cutters and they're cutting us off and taking us up to the police wagon. And they get, like, to me and then to Jared and then they look at her and she says... I'm here too. I'm doing this in Jesus' name. Oh. She says, you have to arrest me too. And we're, and we're like, yeah, she's with us. Like, get her in here. <laughs> Folks, there's something magnificent about following King Jesus. Yeah. There's something tasty and pure and true. People can smell it. It seems authentic. People know there's got to be something more than just working your job and paying off your mortgage and getting a holiday house somewhere. There's nothing wrong with those things. But when you get those things, I'm at an age now where all my friends are getting those things and they're like, it doesn't mean squat. They know that that doesn't smell of life. But what we have is that we've heard the Good Shepherd's voice. And when we heard it, All the hair went up on the back of our necks. We recognised it almost immediately. And we followed. Don't turn that into toxic religion. Don't turn that into legalism and fear. Throw open the gates. Burst them off their hinges. Invite people into this marvellous, radical, transforming, incredibly daring way of being human. The Jesus way. The new covenant way. The good shepherd way.